T-bone steak or chicken in fat content. Fish harbour a lot of bacteria which flourish at colder temperatures such as those found in refrigerators. The fishy smell is an indicator that these bacteria have begun to multiply and have started breaking down or decomposing the fish. The decomposition includes omega-3 fish oils. Once this boiling process has begun, the omega-3 oils not only become useless, but also begin to release free radicals. This begins and leads to a wide variety of diseases. The fact is, linseed oil derived from purely vegetarian sources contains twice as many omega-3 oils. Linseed oil has no cholesterol and it is lower in saturated fat. It does not break down as easily into free radicals as does fish. A recent study published in the American Journal of Cardiology reports that fish is not a boon for good health as consumers are often led to believe. The study suggests that fish consumption does not improve heart health or improve heart disease. Fish contains significant amounts of protein. The Western diet already contains twice the amount of protein needed for optimum health. As scientists have already demonstrated, too much protein in the diet carries the risk of all the diseases of affluence. Accumulation of chemicals, toxins and heavy metals like mercury. Everything from human waste to industrial waste ends up in rivers, lakes and oceans. The consequence is that fish and shellfish can accumulate extremely high levels of toxins. Fish are the oceans and waterways cleaners and filters. They take in chemicals and waste and retain these hazardous substances until the fish die. In 1962, Rachel Carson in her book called Silent Spring warned of the dangers to be anticipated in the future resulting from the 637 million pounds of synthetic poisons which were produced every year and then released into our environment. Since then, as Al Gore has pointed out, the production of these toxins has increased by 400%. In Rachel Carson's words, this pollution is for the most part irrecoverable. The chain of evil it initiates not only in the world that must support life, but in living tissues is for the most part irreversible. Living tissues includes us humans, all the animals, including fish, and all living vegetation. We have polluted our environment in the name of progress to such an extent that we are now reaping what we have sown. We poisoned the environment with all our modern day activities and it is now returning in the form of fish and flesh from other animals to poison us back. Fish bred in farms bring even more health hazards to the table. Less and less of the fish we people eat comes from the oceans and more and more it's being replaced by industrialized aquaculture where animals are raised in uh, enclosed areas where they're just stuck so tightly in there that there's hardly room for them to swim around and as a result uh, this requires an enormous amount of uh, feces and pollution that just settles out of that whole area and destroys the entire um, area of the ocean around them. Soon almost all the fish that people eat will be coming from these farms as we've depleted the oceans and it's a, it's a serious threat. This artificial chemical pigment is used in salmon to give them their nice pink color when they are bred in captivity. Without it, salmon would be a pale gray color. Salmon farmers can choose the depth of the color they want in their fish. The chemical pigment was banned and withdrawn from the market as a sunless tanning pill because it was linked to retinal eye damage. It is very difficult to find a fish that has not been exposed 
to some contamination. All these toxins end up on your table and in your body. In practical terms, for the rest of your life. What should we be eating? Are fruits, vegetables and grains going to give me all the protein and nutrients my body needs? Many people in the Western world today believe that humans have always eaten flesh from animals. This is not so. The structure of our teeth and digestive system speaks to the contrary. The eating of animal-based products is a recent phenomenon. Plutarch, a Greek priest and philosopher who lived some 2,000 years ago, pointed out that man has no curved beak, no sharp talons, no claws, no pointed teeth. On the contrary, by the smoothness of his teeth, the small capacity of his mouth, the softness of his tongue, and the sluggishness of his digestive apparatus, nature sternly forbids him to feed on flesh. All animals that feed on the flesh of others have very short digestive systems, about three times the length of their bodies. This enables speedy removal of decaying flesh, which can poison their body if it stays too long. They also have very acidic saliva and their stomachs produce large amounts of hydrochloric acid, which is necessary to digest flesh. The human digestive system is about 12 times the length of our body. This is necessary in order to digest plants and vegetables, which take a lot longer to digest because of the fiber they contain. Meat has no fiber at all, and so the nutrients can be extracted a lot faster. Because of our long digestive tract, the meat we eat putrefies. Can this putrefication with the resulting release of toxins and proliferation of bacteria be good for us? Our saliva is alkaline and contains a special enzyme which is necessary to pre-digest grain. Our canine teeth are canine only in name. Compared to carnivorous animals, our canine teeth are not sharp enough or strong enough to tear cooked, let alone raw flesh. Fifty percent of the total U.S. land area is used to produce food. At present, the U.S. livestock population consumes more than seven times as much grain as is consumed directly by the entire American population. There is a consequence not just in our health, but also on what it means to the environment in order to farm all these animals. It should not surprise you that the price in environmental destruction and consequences is beyond anything that the people who began large-scale industrialized animal agriculture 80 years ago envisioned. The first step in animal agriculture is that native forests have to be cleared for growth of crops to feed the animals as well as to allow sufficient pastures to house and grow them. Professor Pimentel is Professor Emeritus from Cornell University. We feed 280 million metric tons of grain to our livestock. That's enough grain to feed 800 million people as vegetarians. As you know, the World Health Organization reports that 3.7 billion people out of 6.5 billion total, so it's near 60 percent of the world population are now malnourished. The largest number of malnourished people ever in the history of the earth. It may not seem that important to cut native forests. Trees will grow again, you might say. What is the big deal about cutting trees? Getting rid of forests is a huge deal for the following reasons. Natural forests catch water from rain and snow melt. This not only prevents the water from running off, causing soil erosion, 
The water held by the dense forest floor replenishes underground reserves and evaporates to form clouds. Clouds not only bring more rain, recycling water naturally, they also prevent heating of the earth by the sun. Professor Tom Lyons holds an established chair within the School of Environmental Science at Murdoch University in Australia. His interest is concentrated on the lowest 200 meters of the atmosphere where we all live and is directed towards the solution of environmental problems. When you change an agricultural surface or a native vegetation surface, you're actually changing the climate of the region. Professor Lyons and his colleagues have observed that if an area of more than 20 by 20 kilometers of natural vegetation is removed and replaced by agricultural land, cloud formation slows down or stops. This has a profound effect on climate of the entire region. The cooler temperatures prevent drying. Higher temperatures lead to extremes of climate and specifically droughts. By catching water naturally, forests also prevent major and catastrophic flooding. Natural forests take 200 years and more to reach significant maturity to act as efficient catchers of water. They also make soil as a result of the dead leaves and branches falling to the forest floor. These decompose to form natural fertilizer and eventually nutrient-rich soil. And it takes 500 years to replace one inch of topsoil. And so you can't wait for that. So it's a terribly serious problem. According to Tim Flannery, when measured over a century-long time scale, methane is 60 times more potent at capturing heat energy than carbon dioxide. But it lasts only eight years in the atmosphere. The animals we raise for food produce huge amounts of manure. In fact, these uh, industrial animal factories that are primarily used to raise animals for food in the developed world need to store these species in huge acres and acres of cesspool, which they euphemistically call lagoons. And these, of course, befoul the air around them, but also release large amounts of methane and also huge amounts of nitrous oxide. These are released not just from the uh, lagoons themselves, but also when these species are spread over the huge amounts of cropland that must be used to raise plants to feed the animals. Nitrous oxide is about 300 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. When it comes to methane, about 37% of the world's methane emissions come from animal agriculture. And about 70% of the world's nitrous oxide emissions come from animal agriculture. These gases, which are produced in smaller quantities than carbon dioxide but are far more powerful, have a huge effect. And because their power, and because they come mostly from animal agriculture, it makes this sector of the economy important to target in any effort to address the serious global